Here's a little macabre thought experiment I'd like you to mull over as this video plays. What would you do with your time if you knew for a fact you were going to soon die? Now that's pretty heavy material, and on February 1st, 1994, Christopher Pike released a book exploring that very concept. The Midnight Club book has been expertly resurrected into the Netflix series of the same name, in which we get to fall in love with the stories and characters all over again. In a 10-episode season, we are introduced to a group of terminally ill characters who we see wrestle and cope with their own mortality by telling each other stories and spinning webs of conspiracy to relieve the pain of impending doom. So to those before and to those after, here are 25 things you missed in the Midnight Club. Spoilers are inbound, so continue with caution. Number 1. Netflix has taken quite a few liberties with the adaptation of the novel. One of the main changes is the reality of the world we are watching. In the book, the haunts and the mysteries are far less important than the tragedy and growth of the characters. While the focus is altered for the show, the heart of the story being told stays the same. But one of the lost elements that we don't get to see played out is Alanka's attraction to Kevin. In the book, she believes they share an almost Hawkman and Hawk girl like relationship, being tied to one another throughout her many past lives. Kevin himself at one point starts agreeing, and after Anya's death with no conclusive signs of an afterlife, the book revolves around this budding past life romance, a deviation which also erases the master from the story. Given the book's more all around grounded reality, the removal of one of its truly supernatural elements is a bold one, though the tighter focus the show has on Alanka's research into Brightcliff more than makes up for it. A fan of the book may be a little confused at the enlarged cast. Not only are we given two new characters to flesh out the world in Mark, played by Zach Guilford, and Shasta, played by Samantha Sloyan, but the very spine of the narrative is given three extra vertebrae in the form of Sherry, Natsuki, and Amesh. In addition, the show takes place within the halls of Brightcliff, not Rotterham, under the watchful eye of Dr. Stanton, not Dr. White, but more on her later. These are all surface-level changes, and if you are a fan of the book, it is still the heartstring-pulling plot people can cry over. Cheesy horror for young readers and viewers are a dime a dozen, from goosebumps all the way to scary stories to tell in the dark. Meaning, it's not hard to see the similarities between The Midnight Club and Nickelodeon's 1990 release, Are You Afraid of the Dark? It lasted six years and followed a group of tweens meeting in the middle of the night in a club called The Midnight Society to tell scary stories. But that's where the similarities end, because The Midnight Club is far more about grief and romance, while Are You Afraid of the Dark has no real depth in the form of narrative stakes. If you're a fan of Netflix, you might have seen a little program by the name of Lock and Key, another magical adjacent drama involving secrets and ancient homes. Another thing these two share is a location. Brightcliff is the same house used in Lock and Key. The house was built especially for Netflix and makes Alanka's visits to the basement a little bit more intriguing. The majority of the differences in the two locations are mainly because of Zoic Studios, the VFX team. The first episode of The Midnight Club is chock full of jump scares. Granted, it is in the form of the characters actively making fun of the overused gag, but the Guinness World Records counts them all the same. If you couldn't guess, this episode holds the Guinness World Record for the most jump scares in an episode at a whopping 21 in well under one hour. Seeing how Mike Flanagan has gone on to say how much he hates using jump scares, starting off the show with a plethora of them might have been a smart play, giving the audience all the startles they want early on so the rest of their binging can be done in peace. Now let's get into those pop culture references because there are a lot of them. The show takes place in 1994 and we see Amesh in a game room filled with Atari, Tetris, and other classic arcade machines. He is even playing the Doctor Who pinball machine which was released three years after the show's cancellation. Moving on, there is a quick shot of a Die Hard poster and the music choice can only be described as 1990s dreamscape with such jams as No Rain and Good Riddance. And when we get around to Spencer's story called the eternal enemy, there's a lot more to go. Temporal inaccuracies are the fodder of fake fans foregoing their suspension of disbelief. Yet, it still is interesting to note the release of songs and games in the wrong historical order. In episode 2, Amesh laments his missing out on the PlayStation, a console released three years before the Foley Adieu episode of The X-Files mentioned only a few episodes later. And if Amish is such a big sci-fi fan, even reciting episodes to Doctor Who during the club meetings, he definitely knows if not watches X-Files. Not to tarnish the show in any way, of course, these small cultural nods are not important, and the mistakes are being pointed out just in the name of fun, much like the PlayStation Amish should already be playing. 
Who amongst you has the eyes and ears peeled adequately to spot three cameos and a reused prop amongst the intricacies of the show? Well, that's the quest Mike Flanagan has thrusted upon us viewers. Mike Flanagan has stated the mirror in his feature film Oculus is in the show, in a very inconspicuous place. And believe me, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. And if you're the Sherlock Holmes finding the mirror, then you could turn your talents to the existence of Kate Siegel, Hamish Linklater, and Carla Cugino, who are sprinkled amongst the cast either in voice form or as a background character. Take this as the opening of an I Spy book, and if you can find them, let us know in the comments. Ilanka's dream sequence halfway through the first episode gives us a few haunting images. The most glaring one is of the dead Midnight Club slumped over their chairs joined by a dark cloaked figure. A gruesome scene for sure, but also one that is directly taken from the book itself. The cover of the book has the five original members of the club all staring at the dark cloaked figure. In both cases, the mystery person strikes a pose that mimics the one often used for the devil in tarot cards. Now I'm no expert, but the card seems to represent a whole lot of bad behavior, but one of which is living in fear. The reverse seems to be dropping the shackles of fear, which is a sentiment that the characters come to embrace throughout the show. Many audience members believe that the shadow is death itself, manifesting the untimely ends of each of the teenagers, while some actually theorize that the shadow is Julian, Dr. Stanton's long lost son. The underpinning of the entire story is based off of a real-life fan of Christopher Pike. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Pike explains the sullen tale. A fan of his in the early 1990s was terminally ill with cancer. Her and her friends would meet up at night for a book club that often spoke of his works. Her parents reached out to him in hopes they could meet and a pen pal ship was born. Pike even offered her sneak peeks of the Midnight Club when he was writing it. She declined opting instead to wait for its release. Her memory lives strong in the book and the show. In addition, the group discusses stories not too dissimilar from their real-life counterparts. In The Midnight Club, Kevin's stories are extremely similar to the 1993 novel by Pike himself called Wicked Heart. Wicked Heart follows a demonically possessed Dusty as he plots and murders those around him. Dusty unfortunately finds himself infatuated with his classmate Sheila, and it wouldn't be a teen murder plot if he didn't have to kill his love interest. It's hard to not see the parallels between Dusty's burden of murder and Kevin's struggle with his own maternal relationship. Indeed, a dark and frightening tale recontextualized as an in-depth discussion of guilt. The year is 1988. One Christopher Pike just released a book in the style of noir. The title, Give Me a Kiss. A sorry tale of diaries and backstabbing, revenge leading Alice to a series of manslaughter and cover-ups, a bloodbath of youth and betrayal. Fast forward 34 years and the Midnight Club adapts this story into Sandra's, obviously with slight changes because the stories act as an emotional outlet for our characters. Sandra uses this platform to expound on her current fight with Spencer, and it proves a good point to commend the show's use of Pike's novels because it gives every episode its own unique angle and keeps it fresh hour after hour. Which brings us nicely over to Amish's story. It follows Luke, the love-struck programmer who is given an insight into what his future may hold. Of course, this is another one of Pike's novels, but a more watered-down version of it. Not only does Amish omit the idea that the enigmatic lights in the realistic video game were aliens, opting to conclude that the Illumini were angels, his focus is far more personal, because the ending of his story directly mentions death days, which he just survived himself and living with the idea of not knowing when your time is up. Not to mention his very own sci-fi story, has a gamer protagonist kind of not really sort of getting the girl of his dreams, and that's an ending Amish thankfully gets as well. Ilanka, of course, is holding out the hope that her tumors will leave her body entirely. So when it's her turn to entertain the group, a story of a healing witch who can predict the future must have been a no-brainer. The theme of Alanka's story, based on the Christopher Pike novel by the same name, acts as a sad foreshadow. The idea that fate is set in motion and death is unavoidable is a hard pill for any teenager to swallow. So the incorporation of her tragic optimism and guilt over Anya's inevitable death highlights the story with a very bittersweet context. Number 15, Road to Nowhere. This next section deals with themes of suicide and depression, so viewer discretion is advised. 
Natsuki shares her story with Amish alone when the library is locked. It is a retelling of Pike's 1993 book of the same name. It departs from the plot by keeping the story more contained and making sure it stays true to Natsuki's life. It's a harsh look at the inner turmoil one goes through when wrestling with dark thoughts. Freedom Jack prying on her darkest moments, urging her to stay on a self-destructive path leads to questions that have troubled great minds for generations. So please take Albert Camus' thoughts to heart. Death is of no use. It holds no greater meaning in it than life and in life you can still create your own. Moving on to number 16. On a much less somber note, The Eternal Enemy is about cyborgs and time travel. The Eternal Enemy makes up Season 1, Episode 9 of The Midnight Club, and again is based off of the Christopher Pike novel called The Eternal Enemy. However, Flanagan adapted the Pike novel to better fit Spencer's storyline. Instead of Rella, we have Rel. And unlike in the book, Rel witnesses Chris's death, not his own. Spencer's inner torture is due to the guilt he feels over his boyfriend's death, and this manifests with him playing the role of the robot sent back in time to kill him. This plot point is almost given away the moment we see his bed. Movie posters of Robocop, Terminator, Back to the Future, and Time Cop, the pillars of all great time travel movies. The term Pythagorean teaching is used by Regina Ballard. She says it has both esoteric and exoteric teachings, which literally makes no sense if you think about it. How can ideas be known to a bunch of people and a few people, but whatever, it doesn't really matter. Her whole idea here is to get people feeling comfortable when she speaks with them. And truly, it's hard for me not to make the connection between the cult in the Midnight Club and the ancient Greek cult of Pythagoras. And believe me, if you don't know about the cult of Pythagoras, they're all prime for a good straitjacket if you ask me. They had the idea that the the soul was trapped in the body, forced to reincarnate until they become one with the gods. This was a central tenet of the Pythagorean belief system called the transmigration of the soul. Back in the book, Alanka actually believed that her and Kevin were part of this ancient cycle. And perhaps we'll see more of these ideas played out if there ever is a season two. Anyways, let's keep moving. Writer and director Mike Flanagan has a history of reusing actors that he's worked with in the past. Of course, this isn't uncommon for directors. Think about Quentin Tarantino and Sam L. Jackson. And even within the horror genre, think about Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell. And in terms of Mike Flanagan, there are a lot of them, so buckle up. And first, we'll start with Matt Beidel. He plays Ilanka's scruffy father in The Midnight Club, but he may look familiar as the much scruffier handyman in Midnight Mass. He'll next be seen in The Fall of the House of Usher, another one of Mike Flanagan's creations based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe. It will feature themes of madness, family, isolation, and metaphysical identities. And all that sounds like an average Tuesday for me. All right, moving on. Samantha Sloyan also makes multiple appearances within Mike Flanagan's work. She appears in Midnight Mass as Beverly, and her first appearance working with Flanagan was in The Haunting of Hill House. In addition, she plays an unknown role in the upcoming Mike Flanagan creation, The House of Usher. Keeping on this Midnight Mass train, it leads us right over to Rahul Kohli. He plays a time-traveling game designer in the Midnight Club, and he will also be making a big appearance in, again, The House of Usher. Next up, we got Igby Rigney, who has stolen the show as Kevin in the Midnight Club, but like many others on this list, he was brought over by that other event at midnight. Zach Guilford plays Mark, the nice orderly that Spencer has an active disdain for during the early events of the show. If I were to take a guess, Spencer might have watched Midnight Mass and still doesn't forgive him for the drunk driving accident. The difference is, Riley Flynn is probably suffering from the same hallucinations as Alanka. Nevertheless, Zach Guilford plays both roles with a charm, so when he returns for the House of Usher, we have our fingers crossed for more. It does strike me as a surprise that Sandra, played by Anara Simone, butts heads with so many of the other terminally ill teenagers because one would think they've built up a pretty nice chemistry over on the set of Midnight Mass, which I promise you will not hear about again. Let's revert to the fall of the House of Usher, the upcoming Flanagan project that we know has been teased throughout the Midnight Club. But how? Actually, only Flanagan knows. He has said that there are hints and references that won't make sense until the House of Usher is released. Maybe the arcade machine in the back of the game room simply called the house with a decrepit hand is part of this grand Flanagan conspiracy. And lastly, to describe the Midnight Club as a horror show would not be accurate. It takes more than a couple cues from the horror genre, but the overall story is closer to that of a coming-of-age one. But one thing it does take is a scream queen on the level of Jamie Lee Curtis. Heather Langenkamp fought the nightmare on Elm Street as Nancy Thompson, but the connection to Nancy doesn't end with a couple bad dreams haunting young adults. Her wardrobe at the start of the Midnight Club as Dr. Stanton is highly reminiscent of her color scheme as Nancy, adorned in pink and white, but minus the tattoo on the back of her neck. 
So here is where I must leave you. It's not for good as a season two is always open. Mike Flanagan even said he wanted to end on a less depressing note. If he stands by his word that the epilogue of the Midnight Club book was a huge inspiration, then we have thousands of years to watch with the very least Alanka and Kevin up on the big screen. Anyways, be sure to like and subscribe for more of us here at Screen Rant. Have a good one.